big moment here at Six Fields. All the Vale fans behind the goal. Every penalty you ever take, there's pressure. You do feel the nerves. I'm not going to let you feel like you're shaking like a leaf. But this is massive. Vale were a goal down. There's still a man down. And now so there was a lot of pressure, yeah, but like I say, you just have to stay strong and don't change your mind. It's Tom Pope, the Port Vale captain. Century! In it goes! Tom Pope, 100 not out in Port Vale colours. He joins that special club. Every penalty I've ever had has been massive pressure. They haven't been like 3 0 up. Go on then. This was, let's make it four. There's always something riding on it. I was effing and awing where they go, but I've got a funny feeling that if he was in the squad, he'd get that goal if I wasn't there. Big boost in their fight for League Two survival. Northampton won, Port Vale two. He's moved the red. <laughs> I don't know where you want me to say it. Hold it like that. Yeah, right. Just hold it like that. It's easy for you, sorry. <laughs> right, Popey, cheers for joining us. A hundred Port Vale goals. You must be absolutely delighted with that. Yeah, we're going through this again. I've already said how delighted I am. Come on. You know too bad than that. <laughs> He's killing me. <laughs> when you hear that back, what, what goes through your head when you hear that commentary back and you hear those words, 100 Port Vale goals for Tom Pope? Uh, <clears throat> it makes a change, actually, because obviously when you're playing, you don't, hear, you don't really hear the commentary. Um, I think when you're sat at home and you're listening to the game sometimes, it's, it always seems a bit surreal because you're normally there all playing, so sometimes you don't really hear what's said. Certainly when you get praise, you know, you don't often get it. Um, or hear it, so it's good, yeah. I mean, I, I grew up with listening to George Andrews. I mean, he used to be brilliant at it during the, the days when Vale used to play away. I used to listen to Georgie, and then obviously now you've got Lee and now who are doing it now. It's just it's quite refreshing, really, to, to listen to the commentary, yeah. As a Port Vale fan, to reach that 100 club that's only occupied by two other players, Martin Foyle and Wilf Kirkham, that must mean a hell of a lot to you and your family. Yeah, it, it does, but honestly, not I'd as be much humble. as... No, I'm not being humble. I think, I think it's something that you look back on at the end of your career. I think when you're still playing, obviously it's, uh, there's only three of us that have done it. It's a massive achievement. Um, and you just, you just crack on with it. Like I say, I'm not one of them people that go overboard with anything, like I've said before, the criticism you get or the praise that you get, I don't let anything affect me and that's that's the mentality I've got, that's why some young lads fail, some think they're better than they are, um, because they'll read and retweet or like all the things that people are saying nice about them and, and sit there and get a sulk on when people slate them, so I think for me I just take everything with a pinch of salt, obviously scoring 100 goals. It's an amazing achievement, but it's probably something that I'll look back on in 10, 15 years rather than now, because like I say, I've still got another two more years. We'll just see what happens. My mental strength's probably my biggest attribute I've got. Um, I take the rough with this move. I don't, I don't gloat and I don't, I'll give a little bit of step back when people are comfortable. That's part and parcel of social media. I don't, I don't like thinking it's all about me and going overboard with it. I'll put a couple of pictures on now and again, but say it's something sitting in the pub in 20 years' time. You can tell all the kids. I've scored 100 goals for Vale. You know, it's something that you talk about with your, your kids and grandkids. But I think at the minute, like I say, it's too important to season to to really talk about it too much. Just talking about that day on Saturday, it was a really, really good result, and and the boys are. I think you will agree, showed really good character. The way we pulled it back, going a goal down, 10 men, and then the attitude we showed in that second half. Just talking about that penalty that you were literally subbed on maybe a minute before. So what's going through your head when you see Monty's pulled down, the referee's blown for a penalty? I suppose you've barely had time to even think about this could be your 100th goal. It's, it's happened so quickly for you. It did, but sometimes that's better. Um, every penalty you ever take, there's pressure. You do feel the nerves. I'm not going to let you feel like you're shaking like a leaf, but that's where I talk about being mentally strong again. You just have to try and black it all out. I think 
Any, anybody who's ever took a bit, I've heard Matt Letizia say I won, but if you've got somebody who isn't worried about missing a penalty, they aren't bothered if they win or lose. Because for me, and it seems, I don't know whether it is just, but we never seem to get a penalty at 3 0. Everyone's 0 0, 1 each, 1 0 down. Every penalty I've ever had has been massive pressure. They haven't been like 3 0 up, go on then, this will, let's make it 4. There's always something riding on it. So I think because I missed my last one as well, um, it just adds to it. Obviously, you got the weight, you got 10 men. Um, so there was a lot of pressure, yeah, but like I say, you just have to stay strong and don't change your mind. But not just the pressure of you getting your 100th goal, it was the fact that, you know, you scored this penalty, we could go on to get another huge three points away from home and do something that this club isn't notoriously known for, coming back and uh, from goals behind. You've got all the Port Vale fans behind you there. It, it was a huge penalty for you, wasn't it? Yeah, it was massive. I mean, like you say about the character, I think, I think we've had that all year. And I know we've lost a lot of games and we've got had a lot of stick from the fans. But every game we've lost 1-0, we've had a goal disallowed that shouldn't have been a deflected goal, you lose 1-0. We've had no luck, and I know people say you make your own luck, and, but we've always stuck in games, like I say, barring the, the Lincoln Mauling and Oldham second half, where even then we were on top. We, they only scored a couple of late goals. Um, we've pretty much been in games throughout the season, and like I say, it's just that little bit of luck and that, look, like I say, the penalty. We've probably had four or five of them this year that haven't been given. So I just felt like on Saturday the luck changed a little bit and we got it and deserved it. So, But like I say, going back to the character of the lads, you know, for me it's never been in question. I know some of the fans will. When you're losing games of football, it's easy for the fans to say they don't look like they're trying or care. Um, but at the same time, you've got to have a manager that's giving you a, a game plan that the players are going out there and know what they've got to do. I think when you're struggling like we're early in the season and the manager's going, let them have the ball and we'll try and counter-attack. It was just allowing teams to have too much of the ball and stopping us from getting up the pitch. I think now, like I say, the gaffer's come in and said, press them and get higher. It allows your midfield to get up and you've seen with players like David Worrell and I know Manny, Tom Conlon, they're all, they're all producing the goods now which and being more consistent because I feel like that's the right way their squad of players should be playing. It has been a complete turnaround, especially for March, the positive results that we've had. And it's funny that you mentioned about the luck there because a few times this season we perhaps haven't had the decisions go our way. You know, the penalty you had against Malkin, the keepers pulled off a terrific save and was brilliant all game. When you've taken that penalty against Northampton and you've seen the keeper just get a slight hand to it and it's taken an absolute age to cross the line, were you thinking the worst at that point? Yeah, but is it as soon as the penalty, he comes straight out his goal to me, as soon as I got the ball, um, he'd said to me, I'm waiting for you, so you better pick a corner. But the Morecambe keeper did that. You know, they, they, sometimes you allow him getting your head. When the keeper says he's going to wait for you, you think, well, if he hit it hard one way, he hasn't got time to get there. But against Morecambe, as I got to the, he'd already gone. But I'd already made my mind up I was going that way. But because he got in my head and I thought, well, He's going to stay, he's going to wait for me. As long as it's hard enough, it's going to go in. But he went early, so it was a bit of reverse psychology. So Saturday, the keeper did the same. I'm waiting for you, kick it, I'm waiting for you. And I'm thinking, he's going to go early. And I'd already made my mind up when I missed my last one that when I get my next one, I'll go down the middle. I mean, I tried it a bit high. A bit like the Forest Green one where I hit it high down the middle. That's what I tried to do, but I think the news probably got the better of me a little bit. Um, but... I was nervous when he got his hand to it. I didn't think it was going to go in, yeah, so I was just a bit relieved in the end, yeah. When you've seen that hit the back of the net and you've gone straight over to the Vale fans, you've got the players around you congratulating. You must have, it must have been a special feeling at that point. It, but tell you the truth, I, all the time during the penalty, I, I didn't really have the 100 goals. I never even thought about the 100 goals. Honestly, I didn't. I just thought we've got 10 men away from home. It's a massive three points. That was enough pressure without me thinking. But I started thinking about the 100 goals and everything. Um, that had made me the situation ten times worse, so I didn't even think about it, even when I scored it. It wasn't until after the game when the lads were going, well done on the hundred, that, you know, no, I don't think anybody said well done on the hundreds when I scored. Um, it was just a relief that we got in the lead with ten men, and it was just like a proper team performance. To be fair, he's always, um, 
we've had a lot more problems with other Sunday players than Tom. I mean, it did help him living on the doorstep, literally. But he, he's no, he's always been keen and he's always loved his football. But he did, you know, he, the a few clips there and probably. 14, 15, 16, he really started showing that he could he cut the mustard. You know, I, I thought to myself a n- number of times he was scoring like four and five and six goals. So in, he's mentioned this, but you never gave him the Player of the Year award, he no, said. Well, uh, no, we never gave him, the, no, kept his feet on the ground, see, that was it. That, and keep him under wraps a bit, sort of thing. We didn't want him getting above his station, so... No, we had some decent players at the time, so, you know, he, he might not have won it because of that. It wasn't my vote, it was the other players that as well. I think he'd, uh, he'd fin- he got released at the Vale. Uh, I mean, it was a bit of a shambles at the time. Uh, it was run and one thing and another, and some of the stuff that was said, like in the... When he was released, the markings and stuff, for example, the bloke who was his coach, had, I think he'd give him a C or a D for heading ability. And I, I actually questioned, I said a C or a D for heading. I said, he's probably the best. He's ever. not very good at that now, does and, he? And, yeah. and I thought, where's he got that from? And at the end of the day, I mean, that ruins a lot of players when they they get re- yeah. released from clubs. You know, it does, uh, what's it? And that I think the fact that he'd still got us to come and play for on a Sunday, he still enjoyed his... Sunday football, and then um, he, he started playing obviously Saturdays at a decent level for the likes of Biddlefix and what have you, you know. And I think that sort of kept kept him grounded. And, and it's the best what's it grounding for a footballer, in my opinion, you know, to play non league and the rough and tough of it. And I think that sort of brought him onto another level, really. Where if he'd, if he'd have stayed academy football and this, I just don't think he'd have been the same player. You and know, I, and as a Port Vale fan, was it always his dream to to one day, not just play for the for the club, but lead them out as a captain as well? Well, I don't think that. I think that's something you can't even envisage, isn't it? Really, I mean, you, you want to be a footballer first and foremost, and then the chance of playing for your own team, and then the chance of getting and scoring all them goals, and being the captain. I think it's just a bit of progression of things. I don't think. Uh, he, he never mentioned about being the captain of the club. No, I, he certainly wanted to play and score goals for them, obviously, but no captain. Uh, that's just something as he's come along. Headed in, and Tom Pope has done it! More goals at Vale Park than anyone else. Pope does it once again. He made your debut for the Vale against Lincoln in January 2011. You scored your first goal a month later, a brace actually. What are your first thoughts when you see that? It was live on Sky, that was, against Bradford. Um, I'd missed a penalty in my second game. And I'd just come on there as well, I think, it, away at Wickham. So in my second game, I got a chance, 80-odd minutes to win the game, and I missed it. So it was one of them, you're thinking this isn't going to happen. Um, and then the Sky called Montali and I scored two. So the first goal was the best feeling I've probably had in football. Your first goal to score wearing the shirt that you support, you know, it's it was massive for me, yeah. Saved it for the big stage and the TV cameras as well. Yeah, to be fair, I, I normally always score on telly. Every time we're on telly, I see him, I see him score. So I could, do with, I could do with Sky coming every week or the TV cameras. Got the next one. I think you'll have fond memories of that. First thoughts and that springs to mind. Rotherham. Um, yeah, it's good to get a bit of my own back, really. I think I had a lot of stick. Not too much. I think it was more for the the manager that was there previous. and the fa- I mean, the fans appreciated I worked hard. I had a great partnership with the Fondra. Um, but I just didn't score many goals. Got a little bit of criticism. But obviously, the manager got rid of me. But he'd been sat by them. But it was just a nice feeling to prove a lot of people wrong and to have scored four. You know, I'd have been happy with one and three points to have scored four. was just the icing on the cake. Next one. I mean, I had a bit of a laugh when I saw this one. No one wants to see that, do they? <laughs> What's going through your mind there? That was a massive, that was the biggest game in, I've played in. Well, it wasn't Chesterfield last year was the biggest, but that, when you go for promotion, I think we'd gone something like, I'd gone about 11 games without a goal. 
And I think we'd gone about five or six without a win, and we'd gone from, I think, top to about third or fourth, or fourth had proper gained on us. Um, so it was massive. We were two one down with about 15, 20 minutes left, and I managed to get the hat trick, and we won the game. And I think that kick started us again then, and more or less, you know, give us that boost to, to get us over the line. Next one, we're going to bring you forward a few years now. 4 0 at home against Luton. That's how it was. I couldn't remember what game it was. That was a huge game for the club. That was back in December 2017. It was a real bright month for the club, and perhaps looking back on that now, a lifesaver in terms of keeping their league, Port Vale's League 2 status, wasn't it? That was my. I, I still think the biggest game in our history was the Chesterfield game. I actually cried coming in. The, the, the stress, the build up to it, it was the hardest week I've ever had the the pressure was massive I think if we'd have lost that Chesterfield game we'd have probably been relegated because it was massive they were down there kept them down there kept them out of the way and it was three massive points and then when Pewey gets sent off first off you know you think it, fearing the worst and then they equalise and then Wits pops up with a goal the last five minutes you know for me that that'll be the biggest in the club because I honestly think we'd have been relegated at the Luton game, obviously, it's an three points against the top of the league. It was a massive game. Um, but like I say, putting on a 4 0 win was probably the, the best performance of this all since I've been back. Um, but I'd still disagree and say the Chesterfield game was probably the biggest I've, I've had playing. Just because of the, the situation we were in and the fact that we'd taken the lead down to 10 men and Chesterfield had pulled one back, naturally, you would assume. Chesterfield will go on to to perhaps take advantage of that, but I think did you knock the ball down to Wits for yeah, and behind. and it's a tidy finish to say the least, wasn't it? Yeah, it was great for that's Wits. You know he can produce some things, um, but I just think the pressures of that. I mean the Luton game we, we, it was in December or January. I, forget, I think it was December, December around yeah. Christmas, and I think we went four or five unbeaten. So as confident as I, that was going well then we had a proper slump and we were really struggling we'd gone from getting ourselves out the mess to straight back in it within a month I think it was three months without a win before before we got that Chesterfield one that's what I mean so I think because the confidence was so low the fans were worried we were playing bottom of the league you go down to term the pressure all week building up to it it was a must win game and obviously like you say you go down to 10 men and the stress, the the panic, but the lads dug in, and like like you said, this year with some of the performances we've had, we we've got a strong group who do dig in. We'll li lose some games, but it's never through lack of effort. So I just think the gaffers come in and, like I say, change the tactic a little bit with pressing them higher up the pitch, and I think that suits the players we've got. Um, so yeah, but going, but the Chesterfield one was always the biggest biggest game I've played in in terms of the club's history I think so far and you said that you even got a little bit emotional when you came in in the tunnel after the game I did I was last one off and I couldn't I did I got I got I did get emotional it was just the relief I'd had a week of putting that much pressure on myself to to get the three point it might have even been my first game I think I'd been injured yeah it might have even been my first game back or second I knew I had to be fit for that game so I think I'd, I still want 100 percent fit then uh, I think might have been after me earlier or something, yeah. I can't remember. Because yeah. um, you just missed the Barnet game, I think it was. Yeah. A couple of games. Yeah. Because that was another, we didn't lose that game, we got and a big Grimsby, point down we drew, yeah. we drew, and we thought that run of games, get a couple of wins, we'd be safe. And I think we drew and drew. Yeah. And we were still right in the, in the mess. So, I just think, in terms of pressure, that was the biggest pressure game I've uh, ever played in. To confirm the League 2 status, though, we had to pick up at least a point away to Mansfield. We're 1-0 down with a couple of minutes to go. We didn't really seem to be... We didn't look like we were going to score. And then Luke Hannon pops up with an unbelievable chip over the defence to Dan Turner. He's lobbed the keeper and, and you're there to, to nod it home. And that was another big moment in that season because that confirmed our League 2 status. Yeah, it did. And obviously that was massive to get that that point especially in the end because I think we lost the last two after that and we survived by a point yeah. um, so that I mean every season you talk about how vital points are 
you could have picked any draw that season helped us stay in the league so sometimes when you're playing somebody and don't play great but you pick up a point and the fans go should have won you can't begrudge a point at times because come the end whether it's promotion relegation playoffs you know that one point could be all the difference or that one goal goal difference can be all the difference between being relegated promoted playoffs anything so you can never, it's a tough place to go to we got well, I remember that game I think Tongi at the bar after about five I think first 10 minutes 10 15 minutes we were massively on top yeah and then they just battered us we were very lucky it was only one and then obviously we scored without them having enough time to even do anything I think did, did we have 10 men in that game or did we have a lot I can't even remember no I think, I think did Manny oh no that was this season he yeah, got sent off yeah. there wasn't it um, so yeah just to be uh, in the end I mean if we'd have gone and won one of the last two games he'd have probably said it wasn't that vital but because we lost them both and, and probably our mentality because we knew we were safe probably switched off them last two games um, because we knew it was certain that we couldn't be relegated but it's always good to make sure you're safe without that pressure of having the last two or three games, knowing you've got you've got win, you've got, and then you lose. And we got win, lose, and then it's, all of a sudden it's last game of the season and you're worrying about everybody else. Is there a goal for you that stands out in your mind out of the 100 that he scored? Is there a favourite for you? Oh, blimey. Well, obviously, uh, I'd have to say the probably one that means the least against Stoke, but I thought... You know, I'd never thought the day was going to come when we would probably play, play Stoke in a competitive game, you know, a league match, I thought, or a cup game probably. Them days had gone, especially with Tom coming towards the end of his career. But, I mean, I'd always hoped that he'd score against, get the chance to score against Stoke and to get that first goal against them, that was that was great. But And in true uh, Popey style, gave him a, a, a yeah, unique and celebration. Yeah, sort of rubbed it in a bit, yeah, which... <laughs> which we're all proud of. Starting the season, you started off on fire. Two goals against Cambridge, you couldn't have started the season any better. A couple of weeks later, you got your 56th goal at Val Park and that meant you were the all-time leading goal scorer here. And there's that really good photo of you and your good mate, Louis Dodds, down by the railway. Um, one photo I wanted to show you that you perhaps enjoyed uh, this season. The Stoke game where it's safe to say you did get a bit of stick and you weren't really, you know, as pumped up for it as you usually are for games. But when you saw the stick you had on social media, it sort of motivated you a little bit more, didn't, didn't it? Yeah, I was struggling. When you know you're playing against the kids, it's like playing in a reserve game where you always try and work hard, but they're quite meaningless. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. sometimes with a check a trade game where the squad gets rested and certain players come out and it's just so unless you get to the later stages fans don't get the buzz about it it's not really a massive competition um, and it wasn't until they sold all the tickets that you think this is going to be as close to a derby as I'll probably get because they're worlds apart from where we are at them, even though they got relegated from the Premier League the money they've got it's not going to be any time soon, I don't think. Certainly before I probably retire, that we'll be playing them unless we get in an FA Cup. So it was as close to a dot, but I just think because it was the kids, you're just thinking, doesn't mean anything. You know, really lose, really. lose, essentially. The fans were trying to boycott it, they're thinking, yeah. we're not going. And then all of a sudden, I think we'd sold about 500 tickets and they'd sold 3,000. And all of a sudden, I think the fans thought, right, we better get involved with this yeah. now. So. I think I put a tweet out there, just wind the fans up, so they give me some stick, just just to create that atmosphere. And but you don't mind that as well, do you? No, you that's enjoy why I it. That's why I being it. sort of relating with the fans like that and having a bit of banter. Yeah, I think I think fans are di because football's changed, and you're not allowed to tackle or get involved, and you see less trouble nowadays. That I think the fans have become distant from the players. Um, as I've said before, I mean, I used to go down beers with my dad when we were kids watching Vale and you'd go in the, the Crown and Van der Laan and Taylor would be in there or Swanee and having a pint with the fans and having a good chat and nothing got said, you know. You go up Hanley or go in a pub now and have a pint and it's all over social media. That, so you can't, you can't do it. As much as 
ninety percent of the fans will go, it's brilliant, we had a pint with him, what a great lad. It only takes that one person to turn around and go, He shouldn't have been out on a Wednesday. Yeah. You know, and all of a sudden you're making all of a sudden you gain a lot of stick off section, especially when you're losing games of football. You know, I've been out injured, come back, got it injured. The team have put a couple of runs together and Tom Pope's past it and not good enough and that, that that's how easily it changes and swings with with certain fans. So you can't keep putting yourself in them positions. I'd love to be able to go back to the nine. I'd love to be playing in the night. I'd love to go back 20 years because that'd have been my era before social media. Um, sitting in a pub with the fans and having a drink and having a crack. That's I haven't been down Bilesen for about five years because it's in a it's in a way of the trouble. But it's it's about what you were talking about earlier, having that strong mental ability to sort of block out those sort of negative atmospheres surrounding. If you, if you if you get what I mean. Yeah, you do, but sometimes your performance is, you know, if people want to say you've been garbage, that's fine. I mean, I said in an interview before that throughout this, it's been the worst regarding, in, not just injuries and games I've missed, but I haven't been 100%. The one game I felt 100% was the first game of the season mm. because the second game I did me back at Colchester when I landed and then after a couple of weeks I was trying to come back and I still wasn't right and I got a grade two tear in my glute and I played through that. So it was just repetitive, never being 100%. And then I still got to 11 goals. Then I did my hamstring and missed a month. Then you come back and rush back because a new manager's come in. Then I miss another month. And all of a sudden, fans are going, no, he doesn't fit the way we play anymore and this and that. And you just have to just... When you know they don't know what they're on about, it's easy for me to just go, you know, if an ex-manager or an, somebody that's played, an ex-player that's been here yeah. is coming out going... Tom Pope's had it, then I'd probably more, probably feel a bit hurt by it, do you know what I mean? I'd probably think, well, the ex-players, the ex-managers are saying I'm past it, I'm done. They're probably right, but when, when it's the same people that are commenting on everything, and you know who they are, you'll probably know with your media that when you're doing some of these videos, people will go, that was rubbish and this, and it's the same faces. It's the same on social media with Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. It's the same people that are commenting, saying the same things that they've said about me for years. I know I can't run. So now John Askey's come in and we're doing an eye press. Fans are going, Tom Pope can't do an eye press, he can't run. You know, it's irrelevant whether you can run or You're standing on one defender and letting a poor defender have the ball and then go and attack him with your midfielders, your wingers. It's not about me running around like an other's chicken and pressing. You know, that's the game plan that you work all week for. That's why you've got a manager that does the shape and then says, right, let that centre off have the ball. Once he's had a touch, get up. One of the midfielders will go, Tom Conlon or Manny. The mid wingers will back it up. Joyce will follow it up. And you just force him to kick the ball to pitch. Yeah. Whereas under Neil, when you're struggling, he's going, let him have it, bring it up. And then once they play or not, then go and attack. The midfield's 30 yards deeper than it has been. So whether you're lightning quick or got no, but whether you're a target man or coming in to feet, it's absolutely irrelevant. The eye press is irrelevant, but because these certain individuals have gone, oh, eye press, and they've seen it and heard about it. You've it I heard it on uh, the last home game. Who did we play last last home game? Uh, Yeovil. Oh, Forest Green. Forest, Forest Green. Green. And second, people are going. We stopped doing the high press. Do you know? And you can just go shut up. <laughs> you know, it's nonsense. It's not that you're doing not doing the high press. It's just that they're having more of the ball yeah. and they're keeping the ball better than they probably were before. I don't let anything affect me. Social media, that's why I'm saying to you, I don't mind giving out the amount of stick I get. I don't mind giving it back. Whereas some players will think, well, I don't want to abuse anybody because they might abuse me. I, you know, if somebody messages you, I'll never, I'll never abuse anybody. Like fake boxers, I love me boxing. I'll never tag somebody in it so they can see it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I think Wilder's rubbish or... I think Lukaku's very overrated because he's got a bad touch and he's supposed to be a big lad. And I'll put Lukaku, he's got a touch, trampoline touch or whatever. But I'll never tag him any. So he's never going to see that. And then people will come back and go, well, he's playing in the Prem and you're in League Two and blah. And then you have the crap from there. But everything I do regarding people, I, I don't do it so they can see it. It's just my opinion Yeah. going to people who follow me. So... There's a difference between that and then doing at Tom Pope, you're rubbish, you're past it, blah, blah, blah. There's a difference, do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So.
going away from everyone else's opinion, I just want your opinions now. Looking back on your whole time at Port Vale, what springs to mind when we talk about, say, let's start off with the best player you've played with in your whole time at Port Vale? Gary Roberts. Why is that? Just technically the best player I've ever played with. Not just a Vale, anywhere. At 17, at Crewe, before I got to Vale, he was England under 18 captain, I think. He was ridiculous. It was only life away from football that stopped him being a millionaire. Um, and if he had the right mentality, he probably would have been a multi He'd probably play for England. He was that good. Your favourite goal in the Port Vale shot, shirt? My favourite? I like the one at Rotherham away, um, the dink. But I think the most important was probably the third goal against Cheltenham, which, like I said, ended that run and got it helped us to promotion. But I think during that run, we were struggling. Like I say, I had gone 11 games without a goal and then scored an out-trip. But the third goal was, I think if we'd have lost that game, we probably wouldn't have gone off. And your favourite moment as a Port Vale player? Promotion. No, never top that. Um, and I didn't, I didn't score. I scored 33 goals that year. The, the Northampton game at home, we drew two each. I didn't score. But still, whether you score or not, it's, you start the season, whether you're centre or you just want promotion. That's what you, whether you play as much as you like, whether you score a load of goals or keep a load of clean sheets or get a lot of assists, whatever your job is. At the end of the day, you're involved in a team of 20-odd, 30 players in your achievements promotion. Or if you know you, that's a massive ask, then staying in the league or whatever you're doing, you're doing it together. So that last game, yeah, massive. I imagine, no doubt, on that promotion day, you would have had your family and friends here, a group that you keep very close to you and, and I, I know mean a lot to you. What was that like for them watching, say, your dad, big Port Bell fan? We always see him. He was at the game on Saturday. What was it like for him watching you grow as a Port Bell fan into the player that you are now, scoring 100 goals for the club? He loves and he's brought you up to love as well. What sort of influence has he had on your life? Well, he's, he's had a massive influence, even at 15, playing Sunday football. He's dragged me out of bed because sometimes you're going out or doing it, you can't be bothered. And he'd always make sure I'd go, but he'd never tell me. You know, even now, if I give the ball, if I scored a trick and give the ball away, he'd tell me how bad that ball was that I'd give away and not, well done on your trick. Do you know what I mean? So he's the one who's pushed me and kept my feet on the ground, my dad. Although he does me adding, I couldn't live with him. He used to proper do me adding. Um, regarding my football career, he's the one that pushed me the most and never let me get carried away. Like I say, 15 years old, playing men's football and you show about scoring two or three goals um, and you've got meatheads kicking long. He'd never say after a get. I was at Sneed three years and scored about 100 and odd goals and he never gave me player of the year. Even at 15, <laughs> 16, he, he wouldn't give me that respect. Um, because he just wanted to push me he'd think I'd probably get carried away with it so he's just one of them things I've, I've had a dad that's just good for me like Mickey Adams was when we got promoted a manager that rarely praised me but kept on at you and on at you to carry on doing what you're doing that's the way I like to work and that's why I probably struggle with coaching and things like that because I think you expect everybody else to have your mentality. Mm. I have it with Sunday football. That's why I jacked in managing at the end because you're trying to go in, even though you're 1 0 up and they're playing well, you're going in and shape, rustling feathers and gain on people's backs and they start crying or marding or shouting back and they can't take it on the chin. But that's what I've had from a young, young age with the way my dad was with me. So when Mickey comes in, some players would go, oh, he keeps picking on me. And I just stick my chest out and think, right then. So, my dad, since I first kicked the ball, has been my big... My mum used to drive me everywhere when I was at crew as a kid. Because my dad can't drive because he's bone. So, my mum used to have to finish work at five o'clock, rush his tea and us, drive me to crew, training there. So, both of them were massive. My granddad, obviously, Vale fight. What Vale when he was playing Anley before they even moved here, um, you know, I still, I just wish he'd have been here when I got me hundred. To be honest, yeah.
We've spoken about your dad there, as you just mentioned, and, and the brilliant relationship you had with your grandfather as well, who who took you to the Val and was a Val fan for, for many years. Your nan, when we spoke to her, also had a lot to say and said that you two also have a special relationship. What sort of effect has she had on your career? What what does she mean to you? My nan's been massive. I mean, it hasn't been till the later years, really. I lost my granddad a few years ago and... I mean, Nana's always had a job. She'd always run pubs, run the golf club, did all the buffies. So I was always closer to me, even though I loved, obviously, all the same, but I was always around my other Nana because my, 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 my granddad retired when he was in his 50s, I think, you know, and so every weekend, or if my mum and dad were going out, we'd always go, because my Nana had a pub or the golf club. Um, and then, obviously, since my Nana retired and my granddad passed, I mean, she doesn't miss an home game, really, and... You know, this year she's had cancer and things, and she still comes every game with a blanket. And you know, I think I think I'm a favourite to be honest. Um, <laughs> but you know, she's so strong, and like I say, she's on her own. But she comes every week football. She she's got a dog that's fat. She has, she's got a Labrador. Yeah, they met the and Labrador. It's a it's a horrible thing. <laughs> <laughs> she won't mind me saying that, but um, she'll walk it round the creme. I mean, I think she's about 87 now. And she'll go at the cram because it's that stupid the dog is that it won't let anybody else walk it. So my nana will always have go anyway, but sometimes she'll just go on her own and take it. And it's that big if it if it wanted go. It, but that's that's my nan. She's so she's so strong. So I go every morning match day for me pre match. I have me eggs and beans on toast. She always makes sure she makes me that. Um, so yeah, I mean Saturday's normally my day, and then normally on my Wednesday, on my day off, I'll call around and have a cup of tea. She sometimes makes me a sandwich as well. So yeah, she looks after me. I was going to say you continue your, your little rituals then, like like all grandsons do with their with their nans. Yeah, I, like I say, I mean she's she's worked very hard her whole life. I mean, like I say, my granddad ran pubs for 40, 50 years, and then they had the golf club, and my nan always did the buffet side. So every time there's food on in a pub, my nan would cook it. My, granddad would be on the bar so they didn't really have a lot of time but we were too young then anyway really I mean I think with grandparents as you get older that's when you really start seeing them more often like I say you, you don't really remember when you're five or six how many times mm. you know you see each granddad or nan or it's only as you get older and you start playing football or you start boxing or singing or whatever you do that's when you know where you, your grandparents support come from because they'll always go that extra yard to support the grandkids and she's I mean we've got I think there's 10 grandkids and if all 10 of them were footballers she'd probably rotate with one in 10 and go watch everybody in between because you know that's how that's how she is and that must be a really comforting feeling knowing that every time you step out on the pitch at Vale Park you've always got someone there watching over you and keeping a stern eye on you yeah I mean I'm always there I mean I I've got enough pressure with it. I don't, I don't stand there and think, oh, my nan's here. Um, <laughs> but I think when you're in football, like I say, I, you stand there and you think sometimes, I don't feel great today, I'm not 100%, spe especially when I've been out injured. And then you see somebody like my nan who's had cancer and she's still sitting in the stand watching football. It makes you think, what are you worrying about? What are you moaning for? Do you know what I mean? And yeah. on top of that, I've got my auntie and uncle who are both fighting cancer. They both got bad cancers, to be honest, so there's, they're having intensive treatment at the minute. So I think fans just relate to what they see on the pitch. And I think, you know, we're all human and you've all got problems and issues mm. off a pitch as well. And like I say, I've had my nan, auntie and uncle all at the same time, I've cancer and all go through the treatment, as well as being injured and not being able to go out on the pitch and then get some frustration out or have a run about being some energy, you know, it's... It's been quite tough, but you know that's football. Like I say, there's nothing better, no better feeling than getting back out of the pitch and knowing your nan and the rest of your family are there watching. And just finally, what would you like to achieve before you you call it a day on football? What would you like? What would be your dream to achieve with Port Vale before you call on that day? I don't. I've done everything I wanted, really. I mean, like I was scoring my first goal and winning a promotion. The only thing I haven't done is play in a proper derby, which I'd have loved. I think even though there's a massive gulf between, even if we played them in the FA Cup, I don't think it'd be uh, 
I don't think they batter us for the fact that you'd make sure everybody, the fans, would make sure you wouldn't get you wouldn't get battered. It'd be a, I'd just like to have that. Although we nearly had it, you know, in that cup game, there was still only seven, eight thousand, whatever it was. So I think you know, if we played them in a league game or an FA Cup, you'd probably have fifteen, six, because it's been that long since we've had one. So that's the only one thing I'd probably want. And then over another two years, I'd want another two promotion. That's that's the way you look every year. I want a promotion, um, but regarding individual, then there's nothing. I've, I've scored my first goal. I've scored 33 in a promotion season. I've got 100. I'm not going to be able to get to Wilf Kirkham's because that's far too many. So I think the next target's got to be taking taking over Martin Foyle really, and then seeing what happens from there. Top man, Tom Pope. Cheers. Century not out. And we couldn't trust for any more. I, I couldn't trust. I never, I never thought that it had come to this. I really didn't. I was like he said. I was pleased to see him score one goal. Never mind hundred. So, you know, it is a dream come true. And at the end of the day, I think he's achieved more than we expected him to. And he's had a good career out of it. He's played for the Vale, and if he finishes at the Vale, and like I say, a promotion would be lovely. I think we'll all be happy. To have scored one goal for the club I've supported was a dream come true. That's all I ever wanted to do. Um, so to get to hundreds, I can't, I can't even put it into words. Really, how, how, how much it means. I think. for Pope now, goal! John Pope gets his hat-trick, his third hat-trick of the season, and Bale lead against Cheltenham. From the left, high into the six yards area, headed in, and Tom Pope has done it! More goals at Bale Park than anyone else. Pope does it once again, 56, not out. Big, big moment here at Six Fields. All the Vale fans behind the goal are on their feet. Cheltenham have just got to one of the crew, Billy Waters, scoring against his old club. But this is massive. Vale were a goal down. They're still a man down. And now they've got a chance to secure safety. And Tom Pope with a chance to make history here. It's Tom Pope, the Port Vale captain. Century! In it goes! Tom Pope, 100 not out in Port Vale colours. He joins that. Certainly for the younger, the younger years, we used to have a coat can, like you see some of the kids now, kicking them along the bottom while the game's going on. Like I say, from when I was about four years old, my granddad used to take me and my brother and push us under the turnstiles, get us in for free, just kick us under and pay for his ticket, and, and then we go in. So that's something that's always been with you.